Hi, I'm so glad that you've joined us today for this conversation. Well, it will be a conversation after the presentation about uh, being a wounded healer in the time of this pandemic. What I've realized is as we, I was reading uh, Henry Nouwen's book yet again, Wounded Healer, I realized how critically important his insights are for this moment as we begin to emerge from our lockdown, from this time of fear and anguish, from a time of loss. I know in my own religious community, three of our sisters have died of COVID-19. And we have not been able to say goodbye. We had a virtual funeral, but only seven of our sisters could be present. We tried to honor them and honor who they have been in our lives. But it wasn't where we could hug and touch each other and be connected. It added to our woundedness, I think, that we were not able to embrace. And then I realized that we also have a sister who's 101 years old, who had COVID, was hospitalized and recovered. And she has this persistent question, why am I still here? And I think that question becomes an important question for all of us as we look both at faith, at Henry Nouwen's writing, and at the needs of our world. So I want to take some time and break open that question, that engagement, and see what can we learn together? How do we move forward? So I want to start with what Nowen calls a circle of engagement. Now, this circle of engagement was really exciting for me because I discovered his engagement, his three parts, were the same three parts that I had written about in my new book, Hunger for Hope. But I started at a different point in this circle. But wherever you start, it results in the three critical issues. My order for them was the contemplative life, community, and social engagement. Henry starts with the social engagement, being a minister open to all, and then goes to com community or compassion, as he calls it, and then to the contemplative life. So it really doesn't matter where you start. The important thing is, as he notes, is to get started. And this time of pandemic, I think, has drawn many of us to the edge of our capacity to really, um, how can I say this? Could, could to really know that we are community when we're alone so much of the time. At least I know I've had that feeling, that insight, that our communities have become Zoom communities, that the um, being in little boxes, that we're not at a conference touching each other, that has made our lives different and has led me to sensing that the contemplative process is critically important for all of us. And that contemplative process means a time of quiet, stopping, stillness, listening. The contemplative mission or the contemplative engagement is really that open-hearted, deep listening to the divine alive in our world. It's been a little hard to see on some days, at least for me, and I imagine for you. But that deep listening, that quiet place, where are we being drawn? What are we being called to? And in that contemplative moment, I think we discover the fact that even in our separateness, we're all connected. We are one body, you know. 
But being one body and knowing that in that prayer space of deep listening really, at least in my experience, then opens our hearts or opens my heart to the anguish of people around me. Let me give you a couple of examples. Many of you know that I, I was the leader of nuns on the bus, and we've done seven bus trips, but that's all about political engagement. But it comes out of that contemplative reality of deep listening. And on our very first bus trip, I had had this idea that every morning the sisters would gather for prayer. That was my plan. Well, about the third day in, it had been very intense. We'd been up very late. We had to get up very early for a long drive, and we said, oh, this is too hard to do this you know, in the morning. We'll do it once we get on the bus. We'll have prayer together on the bus. And what happened? Well, we got on the bus, and there were press already on the bus, and they wanted to interview us, and it went on, and we never got to prayer. By the afternoon, we were really grumpy. And we were sniping at each other. We were, you know, just kind of rah, 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 rah. And what I realized was that we had not grounded ourselves in the reason for our action, for our motivation of being connected in the spirit of knowing that we had a mission together. And absent that commitment, that grounding, we could not sustain it even for one day. And so after that experience where we sort of took bites out of each other all day, you know how that goes, we've never since on a bus trip missed our half hour of prayer in the morning. Our half hour of prayer is a very simple process. It's 15 minutes of silent, still reflection. And then the question is, is there anything to be said? And inevitably, there's a richness of scripture, of an experience, of being drawn together in a shared mission. And that is the spirit that sustains the bus. But what I also realized is it's that very centering prayer gathering that also makes the bus community. Because when we show up someplace, whether it's virtual like this or it is in person, the bus brings community, and all are welcomed into that community. So as we talk today, I, I urge you to think about what is the community that you bring? What is your contemplative practice that you share? And how are you drawn forward, and how are you nurtured? So let's explore this a bit more, OK? now that you see it's essential for getting anything accomplished. Well, I think that the, the way Nowen talks about it is, is that in the lead piece that we're called to share our spirituality as part of our mission, that we're called to put our faith at the disposal of others. Well, I, I know, that this sometimes can be a little strange because I lo I've lobbied on Capitol Hill. I've lobbied the administration. I I've had this huge honor of doing this amazing work, promoting Catholic social teaching. But do you know what I discovered in the process? I discovered that my faith became nourishment for members of Congress's faith or members of the administration. And that my presence, our presence, from our organization, Network, Lobby for Catholic Social Justice, is that we not only promoted Catholic social teaching, but that we were called to engage those we lobbied with a care and compassion. So that my stories about the people that we had met around the country came to include the members of Congress who we cared for. Let me give you a couple of examples. Well, the, 
we did this series of rural roundtables uh, in, uh, let's see, I can't keep my years straight, but in 2019, we did a series of rural roundtables around the country because most of our people at Network were city folk. And we, when we looked at where the political tensions were in the 2018 election, it was the tension between urban and rural. And so we said, we've got to learn about the rural reality. We have to open our hearts to those who live in rural communities. So we went to uh, 16 states, 17 roundtables. Texas got two roundtables because it's such a big state. And we listened. Our job was to listen with compassion, with the ears of our heart, as St. Benedict says. And what we found there was the critical hunger for being welcomed into another's life. I'll never forget being in Poetry, Texas. And this, who knew there was a Poetry, Texas? But it's about an hour and a half east of Dallas. And we were in this Methodist church built in 1845. And uh, we were gathering, and this woman comes in, <laughs> elderly woman, well, she was probably my age, I don't know, might have been older. She comes in and she announces, I looked you up on the internet. I don't agree with you on anything. And my response was, great. Oh, we'll have a wonderful conversation then. Come on in, you're welcome. And then somebody came in and they, I'm sorry, I you got distracted. I had to call somebody to tell them their cow was down. You can't leave a cow down, you know. No, I didn't know that. And then somebody comes in carrying a casserole that she's going to take to a friend who's, you know, just recently out of the hospital. And then we get started. And then another guy comes in, sorry I'm late, sorry I'm late. Had to help my neighbor pull the, his mower out of the ditch. Oh, it's great. Come on in. Come on in. Let's have a conversation. And in the course of the conversation, we discovered that the um, they were glad that their local small hospital had closed, but they were really angry that the grocery store had closed. And I was really puzzled. You're happy that the hospital had closed? What's going on? And they said, oh, yes, the, the last remaining doctor was retiring. And he said he wouldn't send the dog of his worst enemy there. I go, oh, all right. But what about the grocery store? Well, it turned out that the grocery store, their business was undercut because more people were moving out to the area from Dallas, commuting an hour and a half in. And what they would do would be to stop and shop in Dallas where it was cheaper. But it undermined the local grocery store who could not continue. So I, I'm from Washington, D.C. I think I'm going to help. I said, oh, well, you know what? It's just come out that the Food stamps, the SNAP benefits, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program is most important for rural communities because it gets new money into the economy. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> and there was this explosion. Those people, those people, they need to take care of themselves. They're just lazy. They go on and on about taking care of themselves. And I finally stopped them and I said, well, you know, when you say that, what I hear is individualism that everybody takes care of herself. But you've just spent the last 45 minutes showing how you take care of each other. You brought a casserole. You called about the cow being down. You came late because you helped the, mow, the guy get the mower out of the ditch. What are you talking about? And no one had ever asked them that question. And we proceeded to have the most amazing conversation. And what they came up with was they really wanted to talk about communal duty, our shared responsibility for each other. And what made them angry was that the federal government comes from the outside, comes down to an individual family, gives them money, and then it's against the law for that family to share. It broke their community. But then, as I reflected on it some more, I think what also upsets them is that the need is so great that, the, that an individual community can't measure up.
to the size of the need. Which made me realize how our community's capacity to care for each other, to have compassion for each other, that is bigger than just my charitable response. But we as a society need to know that when we are one body, we need to care for the whole. And that that compassion then leads us into action. At least that's my experience. Maybe it's yours. We'll have a chance to talk about that. But Poetry Texas taught me that compassion to action means that I care, I need to care for the 100%, even those people I disagree with. So that the woman that came in telling me that she didn't agree with anything that I believed in, you know what happened by the end? Because of this conversation, she was talking to me about two of her children, her two sons in their 40s, both committed suicide because they felt so desperate, so alone, so left out. And she, at a ripe old age of probably late 70s, maybe early 80s, she had gotten two tattoos so that she could care, in honor of her sons, so she could always carry her sons with her. That level of intimacy, of connection, of shared story, I'll never forget her. And I doubt she'll forget me either in the process. But that weaves us together. That is putting our faith at the service of others. Isn't that joy? Painful, but it's also joy. So in this putting our faith at the service of others, then we are called to respond in the moment, to share compassion in an open-hearted way. And that leads us back to a contemplative stance of gratitude. How could I not be grateful for that conversation? That was scary to start with, I'll tell you. But the gift of it, the gift of it in being willing to listen and to ask the question. I think this is the cycle that Henry Nouwen is talking about, about being a wounded healer. Too often, I think, in our society right now, especially in the pandemic, is that we want to make spirituality about individualism, about my relationship with God, about what do I believe. And I think that is a big mistake of the 21st century because we have so much wealth, we have so much capacity. I can live in my little space all by myself and not need anyone. Right. But the pandemic start, taught us that we might be able to live alone. But aren't there all those essential workers? Folks working on the vaccine, folks working in the grocery store, folks who are, you know, driving the bus, folks who are in the metro, folks who are making our lives possible. Don't we need a new way of speaking of the community that nurtures us? So that our spirituality does not become a personal journey. Our spirituality is for community, like it is on the bus. Let me give you an example of that from the bus. On our very first bus trip, we were in Cincinnati, and this couple, Jeannie and her partner, Lynn, came to me from Jeannie's sister's memorial service. Now, Jeannie's sister, Margaret, had died because in the 2008 reception, she'd lost her job. When she lost her job, she lost her health care. When she lost her health care, she didn't get screened for colon cancer, even though her family had a propensity to it, a genetic propensity to it. And what happened was she ended up getting cancer. And by the time she was literally carried into the emergency room, she was terminally ill. So Jeannie and her partner Lynn were at the memorial service in Cincinnati, even though they lived in Madison, Wisconsin. They came to the memorial service. They come to our bus event and they brought me 
Margaret's picture. You can see Margaret. Margaret died because she didn't have access to health care. And w when I heard their story, I, I just I just started to cry with them. I held them. It touched my heart. And ever since then, ever since 2012, I've carried Margaret's picture with me. And she has fueled my passion for the expansion of health care in our nation. Health care is a right. Everyone, everyone deserves health care in order to be able to live in dignity. And we in the richest nation on earth should be able to do this. Well, that's my fuel for my action. But here is this circle of relationship. Then um, two years later, we were in Lexington, Kentucky on another bus trip. And this woman comes up and puts her hand on my shoulder as I'm sitting getting ready for the rally. I'm thinking about the rally we're about to have, what I'm going to say. And she comes up, puts her hand on my shoulder and sits, said, oh, Sister Simone, I'm Nancy Whiting. I'm one of Margaret Kistler's sisters, and I just want to thank you for helping to heal my family. And she walked away. I was like, what? What? So I ran after her, grabbed her, and said, tell me again, tell me again. Well, what it turned out was the family had been blaming each other. You know how you do. Well, you should, you know, it was a senseless death. You should have looked in on Margaret. Well, you had money. You should have gotten her health insurance. Yeah, but you're a nurse. You should have. You should have. You should have. You should have. But what happened? Because I spoke of Margaret, because Margaret fueled my passion for health care, it helped make a sense of an otherwise senseless death. Isn't that the web of community where we very rarely get to know how our acting from a place of compassion has consequences? But I was blessed with knowing the consequence of healing for their family. And so it's woven us together into this web of relationships, which is all what Henry Nowen is talking about that we as wounded healers need to take in the pain of the world as real and let it shape our lives into action. That's what we're called to in this challenging time. Now the pandemic has put us all on retreat in a lot of ways, but now we're beginning to be ready to step out. So I want to pick up just one more theme, because I think sometimes we can get very serious about this journey. And I want to get, share with you five characteristics of the spiritual life that Pope Francis talks about and use this as an assessment. Are you really connected to the spiritual life or are you caught in individualism, in your own effort to be good at this? It's all about community. And here are the five things that Pope Francis tells us in his exhortation on holiness. He says that the first sign of, uh, of this circle that Henry Nouwen talks about is perseverance. And what he calls um, the, the willingness to learn. He says it's humility, but our willingness to keep being learners. The fact that you're at this conference, that shows you're learners learners, but are we persevering in taking our contemplative life into action? The second thing Pope Francis says as a sign of holiness in the 21st century is to have joy and a sense of humor. Isn't that desperately needed in our very challenging world? I know I was overwhelmed by the January 6th attack on the Capitol. I lived just five blocks away. And it was anguish to me to see that level of violence and hate fueling this idea that there had been an election that was stolen and a lie from the White House and the anger and hostility. But what I came to realize was that Anger is justified. But when we come together in a community that can take that anger and convert it into action, there is the change to the spirit of joy and holiness, a sense of humor. 
The third characteristic is passion and boldness. Often those of us who do this contemplative life or do a, a journey or try to be faithful, we second guess ourselves way too much. The Spirit calls us to act. If you've been given this little inspiration of an idea, don't hold off. Don't procrastinate. Step into it because our world is hungry for what you bring. We've got to do this together, but together we've got to step into it with joy and a sense of humor, but passion and boldness. Be not afraid, Jesus says over and over. Be not afraid. And if I would have a critique of, our, of Henry Nouwen, is that periodically he got kind of scared. So we know it's appropriate. We know it's the human way. But we're called to step beyond. And that's what matters, is he always tried to use that fear for the journey in and out to be a minister. Finally, or fourth, not finally, fourth is community, that we're in this together. And we just have to figure out what part we're playing. Some of you probably have heard me say that what I've realized about my current part in the body of Christ is that, yes, we're in it together, but my current part is that I'm the stomach acid in the body of Christ. Because what my role is, is to stir up energy, to digest food, to, you know, make trouble, be mischievous. But in a large quantity, I can be toxic. I need to be contained in a stomach, run amok. It could be a problem. It's called illness. And I need you to pick up that energy and do something with it. See how that works together? So the question becomes, what's your part in the body, in our community at this moment? And finally, Pope Francis says that the characteristics of holiness in the 21st century is to live in constant prayer. Constant prayer. And it's not staying in the chapel all the time or just, I have a little cushion that I do meditation on. It's just knowing on those at that time is periodically I feel like, oh, help, help. It's that wee small voice going, help. That's all it is. Knowing that it's not about us. I'm not in charge. Together, we can do this. We can be the body of Christ that's needed now. And the pandemic has taught us more than ever that we are connected. I wear a mask so that you could be safe. Use socially distance so that I could be safe. We are one body in this moment, and we've just journeyed through a year of discovering it. What you do affects me. What I do affects you. This is the deeper story. So that our contemplative life, our willingness to engage in compassion, and our journey into the world for action is what's needed now. It can feel like too much. It can feel overwhelming, but no, it's not because we do it in the spirit. And so to close, let me close with one of my poems, which is, um, it's actually in my book, um, A Nun on the Bus, but uh, it's called Loaves and Fish. And it uh, references, remember that story of loaves and fish where Jesus is out um, on, in the desert and he's been followed by all these people and the apostles are nervous because, you know, they're going to get hungry and grumpy and they don't have any food. And so they say, send them back to town, Jesus, send them back to town. And Jesus says, fellas, feed them yourselves. <laughs> the poor apostles are like, well, all we've got are a couple of day-old loaves of bread and a couple of stinky fish. Well, what's that among so many? So Jesus takes a deep breath. And, oh, he must have been frustrated. And he says, all right, sit down in groups of 50, ever the community organizer that he was. And then the story goes that he blesses the bread and the fish, breaks it, and the apostles hand it out. 
And the story in Matthew says 5,000 men were fed to say nothing of the women and children. Well, that made me mad. Why were we chopped liver? I mean, nothing of the women and children? What's going on? Well, here's what my prayer taught me. Matthew only counted, or the author of Matthew, only counted the ones who thought it was a miracle. The women knew they brought snacks from home and that the real miracle was sharing, that there was always enough for everyone. But the guys were surprised. So, knowing that, here's my prayer. It's called Loaves and Fish. I always joked that the miracle of loaves and fish was sharing. The women always knew this. But in this moment of need and notoriety, I ache, tremble, almost weep at folks so hungry, malnourished, faced with spiritual famine of epic proportions. My heart aches with their need. Apostle-like I whine. What are we among so many? The consistent 2,000-year-old ever-new response is this. Blessed and broken, you are enough. Oh, I savor the blessed, cower at the broken, and pray to be enough. Thank you so much. Sister Simone's interpretation of the feeding of the 5,000 is both fresh and challenging. Wasn't that nurturing to our spirits? Thank you so much, Sister Simone, for joining us for this conference.